Hello everybody, uh, this is um, uh, the seminar, the work, online workshop, public space and people um, in the Dreamhammer project. This is our fourth session and um, we are very inspired, it says three out of four, but it's the fourth session. As you probably know, um, we are uh, going to close these, these series of four lectures with four uh, online um, seminars open to some of the participants and as we have been already talking about today we're going to uh, tackle uh, with more detail some uh, kind of a participative process as such. So in the last sessions we've been dealing with different aspects of public spaces from the uses to the functions to the perceptions on public spaces, we have been uh, dedicating one single session to participation uh, and, and from a conceptual theoretical point of view. And today we're going to close this um, four session um, round with, um, with an approach, a more methodological approach to uh, to participation in public spaces. So I'm going to try to describe, I have prepared something which would be uh, um, a, a kind of a process of participation around the public space. Uh, it is quite technical and, um, and, but I think it's important because you can, after that, you can, uh, you know, improvise, you can elaborate on that. So I'm going to give uh, basically the, the, the elements and the structure and the narratives of of a participatory process around a public space. It can be around a public space like uh, Store to Get Square in Hamar. It can be around um, uh, a regeneration process in, in, a, in a given neighborhood. It can be around uh, giving use to a building or to a facility. So it's, it's open to different uh, aspects of, um, of participation in, in the city. So I think that's that's uh, useful and appealing for, for some of you who are there. Um, so, first of all, we're going to... Um, um, we're going to have a look to the, uh, to the way in which logics of participation in, a, in, in any urban process, okay? We have, uh, I have selected a, a, met a methodology uh, con uh, which is also um, um, a conceptual approach to, uh, to intervention which is need analysis, which is basically how to make a diagnosis and how to operationalize it in terms of, of a square. So it's not just about transforming a, a square, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's finding out what is going on finding out what are the needs uh, of the residents of the population, what are the forecasted needs, what are the resources available, and how are we going to implement um, the program that comes out of the process. So, first of all, uh, the uses of the need analysis would be um, in terms of resource allocation, what do we have, what do we need, uh, what can we count on. Uh, of course, the program design, uh, what do, are we going to do how are we going to do it, who is going to do it, and the program implementation, which is uh, basically the uh, way in which we're going to do it, the uh, intervention itself, so to speak. Um, who are, are the, uh, the, um, who are the actors involved? Well, on the one side, we have the users, which we have the users and the stakeholders. Users don't necessarily have to be stakeholders. Uh, when we talk about stakeholders, we're talking about um, groups of people or individuals. We have uh, an interest, more or less permanent, in, uh, in a particular issue which is being uh, debated or negotiated in, in a given process. So, stakeholders would be um, um, okay, the stakeholders would be um, public administration, local business, uh, local grassroots, neighborhood associations, um, 
different uh, non-profits that might operate there, some for-profit too, uh, etc. And of course, when we talk about public administration, when we talk about that, we are talking about different set of actors now, a very varied set of actors. We're talking about, uh, I don't know, uh, police, we're talking about health services, we're talking about education, we're talking about uh, the local council or the district council, etc. But these, I understand, are different from, from strictly from the users, which doesn't mean that you don't have to count on the users. Uh, some of the users might be regularly use regular uses, and then there would be like a bit sort of blurred uh, area in which the user might be a stakeholder. But often, most of the users would be sporadic or limited users. So we, I, I rather prefer to, to, to consider them as uh, something separate from from the regular stakeholders. It doesn't mean that they're going to be excluded from the group. On the contrary, they're going to be as active and as participating into the process as they are what we have called stakeholders. Um, among these users and the stakeholders, which I have already defined, we can find action groups, which are those, uh, those groups in Spanish would be conjuntos de acción, um, after the, uh, after the uh, conceptual work of uh, Tomás Villasante, who has developed here in Spain a lot of uh, um, dedicated a lot of energy to study uh, participation, to study uh, ways, methods of making a uh, uh, process uh, more transparent and more participative, especially through uh, through action um, action research. So. Um, we have these action groups, which would be basically those different groups uh, of actors that not necessarily have to be homogeneous. They might be heterogeneous, which are which have different interests. So we can we can mention, for instance, as a group action, maybe um, uh, a little group of uh, grassroots organizations that share interest, but then it might be another little group of, uh, say, business and uh, residents that they share different interests, so there will be a different action group. Uh, but so, still, they're interested, they, they're taking positions around the issue, they have an opinion, they have um, resources to, um, to work on the process, or at least to participate in the process, and they definitely have interest and will. Uh, okay, these are the select the elements that we need to the participate in the process. Um, how are we going to start this? The, the main first steps is to identify the needs and to um, value those needs, to valorate or to assess those needs. So, um, first of all, we need to, uh, to identify the users and the uses. Uh, in this case of the square, but I insist this is a very uh, quite broad model, a general model that can be uh, applied to uh, to a square. It can be applied to um, you know a facility, to even to a certain area, to the uh, public spaces of a certain area, or to um, to a park, etc. So there are lots of different contexts, and you can in which you can think about this. It might be also the, uh, imagine the, rec the, the uh, recycling of a, of a given territory, brown land, an old facility like a hospital or an airport to be turned into something different, uh, so on and so forth. So it goes, it, it goes from, um, you know, very specific um, elements, uh, very specific you know, cases to more uh, complex uh, or you know, differentiated, variated potential processes. So from intervention in specific places to some sort of processes of transformation of the, of the city. Um, I was saying before, the steps required, it's like to identify the uses and the users, who is going to be in this square, we're talking in terms of square now, who is going to be in this square? How is it going to be used? What are the different uh, the different uh, users, uh, the different groups that can be used, identified like as users? 
um, you know, if we, thought, if we think about the star to get a square, we can think about, um, you know, uh, age people, uh, we, can, you, we can think about youngsters, we can think about passers-by, people making, doing some shopping and using the square, uh, you know, as a, as a resting place, people using the square as meetings, uh, youngsters from ethnic minorities, uh, young women, so on and so forth. Um, so, um, we, when we talk about users, we also have to, to identify the, uh, the stakeholders uh, with, the, with the users, and, and this is who are the actors related to that space, who are the actors um, involved in the process. Mm? And of course, the more the actors related to the space uh, are more similar to the actors related to the process, the better. Often this is not the case. Generally, we have a lot of actors, a lot of stakeholders with interests in a given, you know, space or, or facility and they are not, they don't show up or they're not interested in participating or they are actually, you know, they feel threatened or they're against participation. So they're not into the process as, uh, as, as, as participant stakeholders. Then also we have to to make uh, a little little research on who we make an intervention on, and I insist this can be a lot of different things. It can be a square, it can be a facility, it can even be a neighborhood, it can be a couple of streets. You know, so it can take a vari variety of, of forms. Um, how? Well, description of residents and concept. It, it is about researching with with basic data. Uh, you know. Um, what age to the average, what is the average age, what kind of people live around, are they skilled workers, are they uh, professionals, are they old, are they young, uh, they have big houses, they have small houses, um, what are the preferences for leisure, what are the preferences for uh, use of public space, um, um, what is other elements might be well, the size, I mentioned that, the size of the house, the conditions of living, ownership patterns, etc. To have, it's important to have a nice picture of the kind of people that would uh, live around and they can, there are potential users. Um, even in the case of Stotoget, which is a, it's a city square, uh, it's, um, it's a square that gives service to the whole city, it's not a neighborhood square. But even in that case, it is important to know what kind of people live around because of course as we've mentioned already uh, public spaces have different uh, patterns of use depending of, of a lot of things depending of, of seasons very important in Norway depending on um, the time of the day the time slot uh, so it would be very different from early morning to midday afternoon or even night so it is important to know who and when use that public space and or uh, who and when we like to use that public space, okay? Uh, and this is certainly a case. We are uh, in a case of a big square, which is very mildly, mildly used, not, not used as a public space with the intensity that its size and its importance in relation to the city might make us think. Um, on the other hand, it has been a parking um, facility for, for, for a long time, so it was not easy, not easy until a uh, short time ago to use it as a public space, as a whole public space. So this is the elements that we, we need to know when we talk about the description of residents and contexts. And once we are there, we need to identify the needs. So we might do a technical diagnosis in which needs are identified in terms of, well, um, you know, traffic, um, uh, allocation of uh, public space per inhabitant, uh, accessibility, transportation, etc. So we made a preliminary, uh, preliminary technical um, diagnosis, but then we need to contrast that with, with a participative diagnosis. What, what the real people would the, uh, sorry, what the people really think, what the people, um, when I say people, I say users, stakeholders, um, they, they really feel they need, they really feel they would like to have 
in that particular place and um, and especially to allow them to uh, to take part in the whole process. Remember last week we were we were uh, we were mentioning the uh, kind of definition of participation, which is the capacity to influence decision making, the design slash decision making process, the implementation process of a you know of a given policy or program or intervention. So um, once we have decide you make this research on 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 who on how they use it and what they need, which is very preliminary, we need to ask people. We need to go through uh, the participatory uh, process itself. Um, so as I was mentioning before, the need assessment consists basically in, in regarding the program design, the action program, the what we're going to do, and the resource analysis, what do we have to do it? That's very important. Once we have this preliminary elements, especially the uh, resource analysis, uh, we need to uh, develop the process and find out uh, what do we need to do, what we want to do, how are we, are we going to do it. So here I propose a very simple uh, strategy of uh, of um, of, uh, of participation that might be um, well um, a midterm, uh, a long few months about uh, in which you have this structure uh, in which from all the people that are interested, um, which would be the plenary. There is a steering committee which is is elected, is no, named, nominated by the by the plenary, which generally consists of the most um, uh, of the representatives of the most relevant stakeholders, um, grassroots organizations, public administration, uh, business, etc. And um, from that plenary, which we're talking about, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 people. It's not just a whole neighborhood because the people will show up a lot in the first, second meeting and then they would just come down to a kind of, uh, you know, customer, customized uh, size, uh, which would be, a, depends on the cases, but no more than two or three, uh, four dozen people. Uh, among that group of people, we, we decide the steering committee and we decide uh, always in plenary sessions about the working groups. Uh, the working groups would be based on very specific issues that worry people, that concern people. And we will see in a minute how we decide all these things. Um, the working groups are basically the element that is going to define the programs and the actions. So what do we need to do and how we need to do it in all the different elements, sections or issues that we might be considering. So when we talk about working groups, we're talking about maybe uh, working groups regarding, um, uh, I don't know, in the case of Hammer, um, accessibility slash integration. Another one would be, for instance, could be um, uh, urban furniture. Another one would be uh, um, business, for instance, uh, and those those working groups would work on their own, but would also cons constantly and continuously be articulated and cooperating with the other groups. So we need we develop a transversal, uh, um, a transversal uh, work strategy between the different different groups. So what is important about these processes is that they, there is um, uh, a steering committee which it's able to uh, to deal with uh, difficult moments, to deal with conflict, to deal with uh, uncertainty, to deal with um, boredom. Uh, we're talking about processes which are, you know, Quite, I wouldn't say very, very long, but quite long. They can range from one or two months, months to uh, six, eight, nine months, uh, almost a year. So we need very, very committed people, people that are really into it and people that are really uh, knowing what they're doing. 
uh, or at least by not knowing what they're doing, but sure of what they're doing. They probably don't know what they're doing because often these processes are uh, a design and the contents uh, show up uh, with a long time with different, um, how do you say, with different, uh, different stages of, of work. So we have this, the, the working groups, very important, the steering committee, which is insufflating this energy, and we have the plenary sessions which we would meet every now and then, and then the stakeholders and the users, which by the residents, public administration, business, and other actors. Okay. So what I, I want to show you here is something which um, uh, might look a bit complicated, but I think it, I thought it might be very useful for you because it would, uh, it's basically how to make, um, you know, workshop to establish the previously, you know, defined uh, priorities. What are we going to do? What are the, what are the priorities? Uh, priorities would define the working groups. And if you do it thoroughly from this workshop, you would have the different areas, the different issues that are relevant for this particular case and inside each of these areas or issues we would have different topics which are relevant too. So for instance we should be able to find out uh, those three or four working groups I mentioned to you before. If one is um, accessibility slash integration, um, it's probably we can make two of them, uh, accessibility slash mobility and integration. Uh, if we want integration we can talk about, um, you know, conflict management, we want to talk about um, um, youth as, as an element, a very important topic that we want to deal with the regeneration of a public space um, and we can talk about uh, let's say um, uses of uh, common or uh, shared uses of the public space for instance. Okay, so we have different areas, different big topics to be addressed along the process and then each, each of these topics has contains like little chapters, little issues that uh, have to be uh, tackled and that are important for the participants. So let's see what we have here. Let's think that we have a plenary session with, uh, you know, 40 people. Um, and this is when we talk about plenary, this is the people that are really interested and concerned and, and you know committed with the project. So we, we we can also do this with just with users. We can do it with people that use the uh, that space, but this is a bit more complicated. But uh, let's think that we're doing it with those people who have committed to participate and they're active, let's say active citizens, participant cities. So we would put them together in a in a room and uh, big enough. And then we would uh, have a plenary in which we would make a presentation, an introduction, we would see what are we going to do to, along the day, how we're going to do it, which is the methodology, which is the context, and which is the expected outcome. What do we want to have, what we want to find out after the sessions. So we organize random working groups. These random working groups would be, uh, we just put people together, sit it in a, in a you know, in rows, and then we just say, okay, you start counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then you say, okay, all the ones just, you know, show up, and you'll be working group one, all the twos will be working group two, all the threes working group three, and so on. And uh, once we have this structure, which is, is random, so we have tried to break the potential groups or affinities, because generally when you go into one of these meetings, you sit with the people you, with, that you know. Uh, you go with someone, you go with your partner, you go with your colleague. So if you break them into random groups with this system, uh, you are separating those guys. And then there would be a, le a lower chance of having monopolizing discourses in the working groups, which is something we really don't like. We want to have a working group which is random, which is among equals. We don't, we're not interested, sometimes it's unavoidable, but you know, there's also techniques to cope with it. We don't want uh, people sharing ideas and sharing, let's say, organization and, uh, you know, potentially building a small uh, power structures or small uh, lobbies inside the working group. We don't want that. So we make it random to, to grant as much as possible the, um, 
you know, the anonymity of each of the individuals in relation to the others. So when we have this working group, we just post some questions, some open questions, and we make a round or two, and we write down everything in a blackboard or in a, you know, in a big paper. So by the end, we have managed to, and this would take like one hour or something, we would manage to consense uh, for, uh, to agree on, you know, let's say a few, four, five, six, seven topics. Sometimes some of the topics are not easy to agree on, so you just, you know, take both and specify that we haven't reached agree on that particular point, or those particular points. But in general, it's, you know, you can agree on 50, 60, even 70 percent of what's being put on the table. And then you take, you take that to the plenary, you um, talk about what uh, each, each group has a representative, like, uh, like an ambassador, um, and we, uh, you, each one would, uh, not an ambassador, sorry, a spokesperson, and that spokesperson would just uh, mention in five, seven minutes Describe how, what, how has been the working group. What are the conclusions of the working group? Which okay, we agree, we agree with all that stuff, but we didn't manage to agree with all these three points. And then you write everything down. So at the end, what we want to have is each spokesperson to be able to, you know, write in a in a big paper uh, or in a board uh, the conclusions of its working group and put them together with the others. So at the end, we can group we can group the different uh, elements that have been highlighted by the working groups as, as important and as potential in relation to the questions that we have asked. So we're talking about different needs perceived, different problems perceived, uh, different opportunities, different um, uh, potential problems, etc. So at the end of that, we would have a lot of inputs in different sizes and we make um, what we call in Spanish a DAFO, which is... Can you look for that translation in English, please? <laughs> That's right. Can you look at this for the translation of this? Sorry. Um, I didn't realize that it was not translated, but uh, it's uh, weaknesses, uh, threatens... I might find it out. Weaknesses, threatens, uh, strengths, and opportunities. SWOT. SWOT. SWOT analysis, exactly, sorry. <laughs> okay, so we have a SWOT analysis which basically gives you a very clear uh, map of, of a lot of things that, are, that might be happening, that are going on, and that worry people or give hope to people or make people expect something. Hmm? Remember, we are talking about a participative process in a public space and we are thinking in, in a big square like a store to get in Hama, but it's used, these, these methods can be used for literally anything uh, that we can think about in an intervention in the urban uh, fabric, uh, especially regarding public spaces, facilities, uh, infrastructures, uh, stuff like that. Okay. So once we have this, this SWOT report and we have uh, already managed that the participants uh, arrange, work together, agree together, uh, listen together. Uh, you know, we have a little uh, here. We have a little break, and we, you know, we have a coffee and some pastry, and it's a very good time. This is not not irrelevant at all. It's a very good moment to make people come to each other, to make people know each other, to make people uh, refresh their acquaintances with each other. Um, or just find old friends, exchange about things that are not necessarily strictly linked to the to the square itself, but you're generating a nice atmosphere of, you know, of complicity, of uh, work, of community, of group work. Not necessarily that everybody has to end the coffee loving each other, but at least knowing who is around, uh, finding their own affinities, finding themselves comfortable. That's very important finding themselves that they have been, you know, called for something relevant, that other people like them have been called, and, uh, you know, uh, generating trust and confidence and, um, uh, and good, good feeling. Uh, good vibes, it would be, uh, you know, a way of putting it. 
So then, uh, after we had find out in this DAFO uh, report, we um, we find out uh, a bit what is the, uh, the issues that have been defined as important. We make an issue issue work groups. Okay, so who wants to join the work group on you know on youth? Who wants to work to join the workshop on accessibility and mobility or on integration? So. Those elements have been highlighted in the previous um, parts of the uh, of the workshop. Now, people that are really worried or concerned with those aspects are going to be able to discuss them. And then we go back to a plenary, in which the, the story repeats. Uh, a spokesperson from each group would um, would you know describe the uh, conclusions of the group, the reflections, what they agreed on, what they didn't agree how they reach consensus, etc. And then again, we have a priorization. So we have um, a matrix in which we have concentrated a number of elements for the diagnosis. So each working group would launch uh, a few issues which would be in a plenary session would be agreed upon or rejected or just uh, you know left on the side. Uh, and then we'll have a, a fairly nice diagnosis about the in this case, our, our square. Well, what is needed in the square, what is expected from the square, what are the problems of the square, what are the ways in which the square can be, uh, you know, um, put back into value, how important is the square, etc. Um, one of the important aspects of these processes are also the way in which they, um, I would say, make participants feel relevant, feel important, feel listened to. Uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, residents, uh, like the old lady, which is, uh, you know, it's an ecstasy because she's asked about her opinion. Uh, I'm talking about uh, big businessmen, about uh, policy makers, decision makers, uh, you know, putting these people together to work with different people, with different interests, with different aspirations. Sometimes at the beginning it's a bit uh, blunt, it's a bit strange, uh, but if it's the workshop is well carried, the workshop is um, you know taken with some you know with some good orientation. You you would do you would make these people uh, work together. You would make these people empathize and discuss in and this is the key of all in a horizontal way. There would be equals. There would be peers. In this, in this process, which is another very important aspect of it. So, um, this is the description of, the, of, of a workshop, of a model of workshop, which is based on the uh, European Union, uh, European Awareness... Oh, I wrote it. It's E-A-W-S, European Awareness Workshop Scenario. Oh no, European Awareness Scenario Workshop. It's properly written. It's a very complicated word. So basically it's to it's a workshop to um, develop awareness uh, on a given scenario and it's used for a lot of things. It's very very handy also to uh, tackle conflicts, community conflicts with different positions, with uh, you know conflicts in which parts haven't been able to discuss or negotiate in a long time, uh, and putting them to work together is very, uh, is very enriching. Mm -hmm. um, I have a number of experiences around these, these methods with different variations because, of course, you always, you might change some little things depends on the people you're dealing with, the conditions, the time you have, etc. But my my experiences are, are quite good. Um, my experiences I've done it with in Madrid a lot in different regeneration processes. Of, squares of neighborhoods. Uh, we've done it in a large scale uh, in Palma de Mallorca in the Mediterranean when the, with the uh, renewal, regeneration mother of Playa de Palma, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, and it was very successful. We, we do it in a, with different groups like hotel owners, business owners, workers, unions, uh, immigrants, um, housewives, different stakeholders and we managed to, to arrive to very interesting conclusions and very uh, when you have the chance of doing these with different stakeholders 
uh, you really can make yourself a map of what's going on and what people think is going on. Because a lot of the uh, elements that show up in these processes are, are perceived uh, problems, perceived threatens, uh, perceived opportunities, uh, perceived um, uh, whatever. So it's, it's quite important to, um, to put people together, but also do it in a, in a way in which you can track the different uh, options that users slash stakeholders can, can provide to the system. Let me have a look to the chat. Do we have anything in the chat? Yes. Um, and see what we can go back to. Uh, there is a debate around how, how the people could be involved in the project. How these people would be involved in What's our experience from what what is deep people? We have a question uh, by um, Agatha, which is uh, yeah, sorry. How deep people could be involved in, into a project via online way? How you would deeply, oh, how deeply? How deep? Yeah, that's right. I th sorry, Agatha. I thought it was how people that are deep can be involved, not how people in a deep way can be involved. Uh, it, that's a big issue uh, online. I never. I don't think I've done it online. I mean, probably experiences on that. Uh, actually, these guys here in Costa Urbano were are developing a whole tool on that. It's called What If, um, which includes uh, online participation. This addresses a quite, um, a quite interesting topic, which is, of course, the digital. How do you call it? How do you call that? Uh, break. The digital break, or the digital gap, or the digital okay. abysm, uh, which is something I've, I've been often discussed with some of my colleagues here, which is, okay, this is a very interesting way of participating. New technologies give us um, lots, of, um, lots of opportunities to communicate. Uh, but um, what happens with the people that don't have access? And this is a problem which a challenge that we are facing straightforward in, in, in Hamar because um, it's continually, continually addressed. Uh, one, actually, one of our colleagues, um, Susanna, which had to unfortunately had to leave the course for working reasons, was, was, was worried with this issue, was saying, okay, how can we link the virtual worlds with the real world. And one of the aspects she wanted to address is how can we tackle, uh, how can we reach that people that don't really have access to the internet. And you have different options. You have uh, the option of, um, you know, introducing people with uh, no contact with the new technologies into the new technologies you know, habilitating spaces in which they can communicate and interface, which obviously maybe is different from the experience of a young guy which can do it from, from his place, but if, if you uh, disseminate appropriately and if you visualize the process, you can have people eager to participate, which are not, um, let's say, uh, very, very introduced in the new technology, and they can go, if they know they can go to a place and have the chance that might enhance and that might act uh, as a catalyzer for them to introduce themselves into new technologies. But still, they're, they're, that's an issue. And, and I don't think you can aspire to have a process of, of these dimensions only with online resources. I think we need, because that's the whole thing about, we need to interact, we need to look at each other's face and we need to talk and discuss and agree and disagree. Um, um, I mean, what I'm going to tell you, uh, we, we're here online and we have been uh, arranging this workshop online and we have been looking at each other's faces. I mean, and it has worked and, and it works for a number of, of cases. But I think, I still think that uh, we shouldn't never, uh, um, you know, neglect the, uh, human side of participation, which is actually the, uh, the backbone of it. It is about interaction, it is about exchange, it is about uh, togetherness, it's about building 
together. It's about group, and uh, and I think it's something which, especially, and, and this is a kind of paradoxical thought, to to some extent in the context we live in, in which uh, we tend to. Sorry for the uh, inconvenience. We are very, uh, we are very, very embarrassed about what <laughs> happened. Uh, basically, our our router and the whole system, electricity just electricity right. system, just went off, and we didn't realize because it has a different section for the computers and for these rooms. So here we're back again. Uh, I don't know exactly when we were lost. I think we were talk about. Online. Uh, online participations. I don't want to repeat myself more than really, usual. I would like to add something if you want. Okay, yeah, yeah. Francesco wants something to say. Has yes. something to say about this I was, issue. Can, okay, uh, I, uh, I was uh, saying uh, before in the chat, before the break, that uh, I think that uh, uh, Agatha is r raising a very interesting question about uh, not only the online um, uh, participation, but uh, a specific point I think is very interesting for me and uh, for everybody who is working on that, which is the uh, how how deep how deeply can uh, participant online can be involved because I think we cannot think about uh, online uh, participation uh, in within the sa uh, having the same role that people uh, who are living on the on the site. And I think that, mm, in my opinion, after this experience with Andres and uh, in general with Dreamhammer, I think that uh, the most interesting thing, uh, thing of having uh, people uh, like you from different parts of the world is not uh, to produce design um, solution. It's just to, have, uh, to uh, in, increment, uh, implement the debate around the, the public space and also, um, as Jose was saying in the uh, previous session, uh, to help uh, us and people from Hammer think and give inputs about which kind of atmosphere we can create for public space. I'm sure that you you can imagine things that uh, people from Hammer or we in Madrid, we can't imagine. So I think this is the most important thing. Um, okay, uh, okay. I, Christian is... Thank you. Uh, we, uh, yes, first of all, we, uh, we have been like 10 minutes off, so we will finish at quarter past if it's all right for you. Uh, and then uh, Francesco and me would, would go for a final beer to close the workshop. Uh, adequately. <laughs> so um, Christian says about online participants, what is interesting is the difference in identity and belonging to a physical place. Okay, but uh, that's that's right for this case, but you have to think that this thing we're doing here now, it's a very specific, I would say, experiment in which we are, some of us are, um, are participating in a process which takes place several thousand kilometers from our place. And that's right, Christian. Uh, even you, you are Norway, Norwegian. You are several hundred thousand kilometers from here. But generally, when I think about um, about online participation, I'm not just thinking. I'm not really thinking something like this, in which people from different parts of the world might influence uh, process, a decision-making process in a given place. Uh, I don't think this should be open as, as that. This is a different case. We're we are just pulling ideas and pulling debates and discussions about a place, about a project which is going on in a, in a given country and uh, you know, direct uh, participation or indirect, indirect intervention. When, when we talk about online participation, I'm thinking about locally um, based online participants. Um, okay, are we on? Yeah. Uh, we're talking about online participants. So we're talking about uh, that you know that person that is in her place uh, is maybe half an hour from in this case from the square or it's in the metropolitan area of uh, Hamar 
and the, she's asked something or she wants to contribute with something or she wants to say, look, uh, you know, I like this and this of the square and I would like it to be like this and include this other thing or I don't like that or, or the other or I don't agree with that position. So the chance of, of participating, of, of taking part in debates or taking part in decision making through the internet. But I understand when you talk about participation, you need to be related with the place where you are you're talking about and you need to know the place you need to have some attachment and as as, as christian was saying uh, you need to have some belonging or some identity or some interest you need to be a user or a stakeholder or a potential user but i think it's uh all of other options uh might uh might might hinder the real capacity of participation of, of, of local residents of local users because it, would, it might have the risk of blurring it out. Um, so definitely, as Francesco says, inclusive approach is very important. But are there any other things that we want to... Because uh, I think this is a good way of finishing their, our session today with this very vivid debate. Um, without online tools, we never involve students from university or you. Uh, that's what Francesco says. That's, that's very right. I mean, there are some groups, increasingly, that they, they need to have internet to, to react. But I think it's interesting also to think how participation and new technologies um, have the capacity and the virtue to activate uh, community level at a very micro level, at a neighborhood level, at a square level, and even a street level, like... Uh, and I think that's a virtue of the, of the online participation. And when say online participation is not just, you know, having the chance of voting or, you know, participating in a, in a given uh, process, which is uh, bottom down, but also, and, and increasingly, I mean, the case of Madrid is very, very, very important. And I think Berlin too, uh, New York City, we have, when we, call, when we say about, we talk about online participation, we're talking about people participating in an informal way, gathering together with lots of different um, uh, outcomes, but also with a lot of different, um, uh, what do you say, projects or things to do. So you have from the very, very uh, ephemeral, temporal, uh, you know, call for meeting in a square and have a lunch together. Uh, in which, which, which is just very informal and you just meet people uh, or you appropriate space for a couple of hours which is that might be a, it's a case of clearly online participation you cannot do it anywhere else, any, 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 another, in another way unless you meet personally everyone or call them by phone but this is very open so you can gather new people and build up networks and it ranges from that to uh, the commitment over, uh, let's say, intervening in a in a given space and uh, or a squad building or uh, you know um, design a public space which is abandoned or a plot of land, etc. So the online participation is you should you shouldn't just think about what we're doing now. You shouldn't just think of top-down participation. Uh, you know, with, with digital tools, but we really have to think in a, in a vast, huge range of opportunities that we are uh, discovering. And I think this is a beautiful period for participation, for citizenship building, for community building at the very micro level. This is, this is about the city we live in. It's about the city we walk around. This is about the city, uh, the, the, the corners of the city we, we go through every day and we think about what, what if... We, we can do something, and that's what uh, this, this project we're giving, we, we're... Okay, so it's about, uh, I was saying, it's about the, um, the local, how internet has a chance of, of developing uh, consciousness, identity, even meanings in a, in a very micro-local level, which has been, which on the other hand, has been a neglected by generally by you know public administration or by public opinion or even by the perception of people in which small is might, might be beautiful but it's definitely not exciting and we're going back through new technologies uh, especially among young people not very young people but young people people in their 20s uh, early 30s 
to uh, to discover how small is beautiful is exciting and it's very very reachable uh, for the good and for the not so good because uh, of course the new technologies have been also uh, somehow the protagonists of uh, of the riots in, in in London this summer and I don't know whether that's participation or not but it's collective action certainly and participation is, is part of collective action so I'm not saying that those riots were participative but they were certainly using uh, new technologies to um, to call people to highlight places and at a very micro local level and, and this same capacity can be very virtuous if we talk about participation and community building. Uh, Christian says that the relation between information overload and the need for securing decisions capacities is super interesting. Diversity, diversity versus indeterminacy. Wow. Yep, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good conclusion. That's a good one, man. Um, I don't know, I think to, I try to, to think, when I think in participation, probably it's because my experience in, in, in neighborhoods tends to make it something still small. Um, of course, uh, new technologies provide trucks and trucks of, of information which we're not able to digest at all. But we want to have, we want, we need to have, or we think that we need to have. So I think it's also interesting to think about um, participation and new technologies uh, as um, a way of rationalizing the. Um, the wild side of new technologies. This idea of hyperinformation, of hypertrophiation of information with the incapacity of of digesting information and this kind of uh, you know outscale supply of of flows of information. We we really don't need those, those so much. And we what we need is to use technologies in the most efficient way. And we should use technologies to recuperate the good things that uh, we have sort of neglected in community life and we should use technologies to make life, social life, much better, more efficient, more satisfactory, more creative, more innovative and, and in the, you know, and um, we should talk about that, yes, indeed. Um, so, um, if you have some further, maybe we can leave it here. This is, this will be your occupation. <laughs> uh, we can, we can, we've been cut again. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's, this is a big topic. We're, we're sort of going out of our, of our topic and we're going into very nice, interesting seas of debate and uh, oceans of debate and, uh, and, and exchange. And this is probably a very good example of how, how new technologies can, um, feed and nurture participation and, and, and social exchange that's the one we're doing here which is uh, I still I'm, I'm every time I, I link myself to this experience I'm, and, I'm fascinated and I'm fascinated with seeing your faces and seeing you or talking to you or exchanging uh, then reading your thoughts in the in the posts so on and so forth. So to sum up before this collapses again, uh, you know, let me tell you that it has been really very, very interesting, very stimulating session or experience that I think we have um, put together very interesting um, pieces of thought, of reflection um, in both sides. I guess I have, uh, we have from this side, um, give you a lot of uh, stimulation or maybe some some ways of looking at things which is the ways from social science which which are very uh, useful for either for architecture for architects and for people working in the physical dimension of space but on the other side also uh, I think we have been very gladly surprised of of the degree of interest you have in these of the degree of knowledge you have in these and uh, your capacity of uh, you know of putting nice inputs on, on the whole uh, on the whole process so please uh, well you know where you are where we are we still have a couple of interactions to be finished which is your um, your posts your PDFs with your projects and of course you know where you have your colleagues your friends here in Madrid for anything you need and uh, I think it's, it still works <laughs> yeah. um, so um, 
thank you very much for for being there all this time and uh, for building this together with us and uh, hope we can see each other as soon as possible okay bye bye bye